I'm going to talk about uh, some mathematics that uh, just about everyone who's programmed computer graphics ought to be familiar with. But I'm going to go into uh, some details about mathematics you probably haven't heard of, even though they were discovered uh, over 150 years ago. Um, there are some, some deeper things that connect all of the mathematics that we see every day, things like the dot and cross products, the scalar triple product. Uh, you're probably used to representing planes as four-dimensional vectors. Uh, you're probably used to using homogeneous coordinates. Um, a little less common are the use of Pluker coordinates for representing lines. Those are six-dimensional representations of a line. Uh, and you may have heard of the fact that you have to transform normal vectors with the inverse transpose of a matrix that you'd normally use to transform points or directions from one coordinate system to another. Uh, it turns out all of this stuff is part of a larger mathematical system uh, known as Grassmann algebra, named after Hermann Grassmann. And a lot of people don't know about this bigger picture. so. I, I want to tell you about it uh, because it'll give you a deeper understanding of some of the things that are going on when you use these kind of things and it can turn you into a better programmer. So like I mentioned this was all discovered, uh, the, the mathematics behind all of this was discovered in about 1844 by Herman Grassmann and uh, of course he didn't know about the applications to computer science computer graphics, but uh, knowing about it today will help us understand some unusual properties of some of the things that we work with and it will make us better 3D programmers to know what's going on behind the scenes. So just a, a little bit of history, uh, the mid-1800s were a really good time for this kind of mathematics. Uh, it started with William Hamilton in 1843 who discovered quaternion multiplication. Uh, and then very soon afterwards, Herman Grassmann developed what he called his exterior algebra uh, or his theory of extension. And that has to do with what I'm going to talk about today, uh, developing a mathematical system in which you have scalars and vectors, but then there are a lot of other things too, uh, called bivectors, trivectors, et cetera. And uh, Hamilton and Grassmann's work weren't really related, or they, they seem to be unrelated. There are different kinds of product structures. Uh, but Clifford, uh, later in the, 18th, in the 19th century, uh, unified these, the ideas behind quaternions in the exterior algebra. And that turned into what we call today the geometric algebra. So this diagram just shows the relationship among uh, some of these fields. The quaternions and Grassmann algebra are actually separate components of a more general system called Clifford algebra. And then Clifford algebra can be special cased into what we call geometric algebra today and what physicists call space-time algebra. There's actually a lot of use of Clifford algebra in physics. Um, but I'm not going to get into any of that. I'm just going to talk about the Grassmann algebra box and how it relates to computer graphics, the things that we use every day. And I'm going to talk about Grassmann algebra in three and four dimensions. That's where all the interesting stuff happens. That's where uh, it really maps onto hardware well, because we're talking about things with four components most of the time. I'm going to introduce the, the wedge product, which is the, the primary way of multiplying things together in this mathematical system. Uh, and I'll talk about bivectors, trivectors, quadvectors, things that arise in this system in addition to scalars and vectors. Uh, transformations from one coordinate system to another. I mentioned that normal vectors transformed in an odd way before. There, there's actually a reason behind that that I'll talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about homogeneous coordinates, not just for, for points, but for lines and planes. Uh, geometric computation, like taking intersections between planes and lines, uh, unions between points, lines, and planes to create larger objects. And I'll talk about uh, programming considerations uh, in implementing all of this. All right, so the most fundamental product in Grassmann algebra is called what we call the wedge product today. Uh, Grassmann actually called it the 
progressive product, and other people call it the exterior product. Um, I'm just going to call it the wedge product. And just like the dot product and cross product, it's, it gets its name from the symbol used between the two things that you're multiplying together, an upward pointing wedge. And we read that A wedge B, just like you would say A dot B or A cross B. OK, and it's defined between scalars and vectors, and we'll define it among other things like vectors and bivectors and trivectors in a minute. Uh, nothing really special happens with scalars times scalars or scalars times vectors. It just does what you would expect. Uh, it's just ordinary multiplication. Um, but we make the, uh, the rule that if we take the wedge product with any vector with itself, then that's always 0. And we can actually start with that rule or start with another rule. Uh, and that the fact that anything multiplied by itself is 0 also means that uh, the wedge product is anti-commutative with vectors. So if we were to just uh, go through a little proof here uh, by taking a vector a plus b and wedging it with itself, then we can really easily get down to the fact that a wedge b equals negative b wedge a. Uh, and that just happens because, remember, anything that's wedged with itself is 0. So this goes away, and the b wedge b goes away. We're only left with this. We move 1 to the, to the other side of the equation. <clears throat> so th this fundamental property allows us to actually derive from just the fact that v times v equals 0 we, we can derive the formula for the cross product and dot product, scalar triple product. Everything just falls out once we have this simple rule. Oh, thank you. And uh, the, the first new entity that arises in this system is called a bivector. Uh, so when we multiply two vectors together with the wedge product, we don't get a scalar or another vector. We get something new. So, uh, it's a bivector. It's completely different from scalars and vectors. Um, and it represents a 2D area, an oriented 2D area. So imagine a sort of planar object in space whose area is given by uh, the parallelogram, whose sides are the, the two input vectors. And its orientation is represents the plane in which the, the two input vectors lie. Now, because the wedge product is anti-commutative, uh, the order of multiplication matters. And uh, bivectors can have one of two orientations in any given plane. So if we multiply a times b, we have a, a counterclockwise orientation. And if we multiply b times a, then we have a clockwise orientation. And the difference between those two is just that one is the negative of the other. OK, so in three dimensions, um, we actually see bivectors all the time. And I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, but let's just start with three orthonormal basis vectors, uh, e1, e2, and e3 perpendicular to each other, then, of course, any 3D vector A can be expressed on that basis as just three coefficients, A1, A2, A3, uh, times those basic ve vectors. Now, when we take the wedge product of two vectors A and B, and we write it out uh, in terms of the basis vectors, then we get the top line here. OK. And if we were to multiply out just distribute the multiplication among terms on both of these sides. Uh, then we get this line. And we end up with six terms, because we had 3 times 3 here. Um, but notice that we have e1 wedge e2 here, and then e2 wedge e1 here, and then the same for the other ones. 1 times 3, 3 times 1, 2 times 3, and 3 times 2. Uh, whenever we reverse the direction, it's just the negative. So e1 wedge e2 is just negative e2 wedge e1. So we can take the coefficient from that one and the coefficient from that one and combine them. But of course, we're going to neg negate this one because we're going to flip the order of these two basis vectors. And when you do that and collect terms, you get the bottom line, uh, three terms. So we have an e2 wedge e3, e3 wedge e1, e1 wedge e2. And they have these scalar coefficients derived from the original coefficients of our vectors a and b. 
Now those numbers oh, oh first of all, um, these three entities here, these are basis bivectors. So the wedge product between two vectors is a, ve is a bivector, and we have three of them. And uh, I've written them in the order in which one of the basis vectors is missing. So E1 is missing from this one, so it's first. E2 is missing from this one, so it's second. E3 missing makes the third bivector basis vector. Um, uh, these coefficients probably look familiar. They are the same as what you would get from the cross product, A cross B. Um, but the difference is that we're expressing it on this basis now, the, uh, the bivector basis. We're not expressing this in terms of E1, E2, and E3. It's the same coefficients expressed in terms of these bivector basis elements. And instead of writing wedge products for those all the time, we'll just add indexes to our subscript as a little shorthand notation. So the same thing, rewritten with that notation, uh, is these coefficients of the cross product times our three basis bivectors again. Now, the cross product is not an associative operation. So it takes A cross B and produces another vector, which we cross with C. And that's not always the same as A cross B cross C. Uh, and the cross product is only defined in three dimensions. But the wedge product is associative. It doesn't matter where we put these parentheses for the wedge product. Uh, and the, th the thing is that when we take a wedge product among three things, we don't actually get a vector back. We, we get something new in addition to uh, vectors and bivectors. Um, so I'll, I'll get more into this later. But the bivector, the, the wedge product is associative, and it can be extended to higher dimensions. So the cross product only really defined in three dimensions uh, so it, it's it's kind of limiting, and the, part of the reasoning behind this talk, that w something I, I, I intend to get across here, is that the cross product is really kind of a, a, an abuse of a deeper mathematics that that ex that extends through any number of dimensions. It's just something that happens in 3D, and it, it doesn't really uh, convey an understanding of what's happening behind the scenes. OK, so I mentioned multiplying three things together. Just like multiplying two things together gives you a bivector, multiplying three things together with the wedge product gives you a trivector. Uh, and that's yet another new mathematical entity that's distinct from everything we've seen so far. And it represents a 3D-oriented volume. So suppose we started with uh, a bivector, A wedge B, and that represents the base of a, of a cube here, and we multiply by a third vector C, then we get an oriented 3D volume. And uh, and in three dimensions, it only has one component. Because when we multiply everything together, if we were to expand A, B, and C out in terms of the basis vectors, multiply everything together, and then collect like terms, changing signs wherever we needed to to get our basis vector to look like this, then we just end up with a single number multiplied by a single basis vector. And that number uh, you probably recognize as the determinant of a matrix whose columns are A, B, and C. Now, why is there only one basis vector? Because there's, there's only one way that we can choose three vectors out of a set of three vectors. Now, since there's only one component, it looks like just an ordinary number. And physicists have called this the, the pseudo-scalar um, or anti-scalar. Um, it looks like a scalar, but it actually behaves just a little bit differently. Because if you were to transform into a different coordinate system by flipping one of your axes, by uh, using a mere reflection in your matrix, then pseudo-scalars actually change their sign. They, they negate. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So. Uh, you may be familiar with the scalar triple product, which also gives you the determinant of a matrix whose columns are A, B, and C. If you take A cross B and then dot that with C, you can also permute these into uh, a different order and get the same answer. Um, so the wedge product, A wedge B wedge C, gives us a trivector in 3D that has the same magnitude as this, 
Um, but we can extend this to higher dimensions. It makes sense to, to do that if A, B, and C are not three vectors. Of course, we don't get a scalar in those higher dimensions, though. You have to keep wedging more, more things in to get to the scalar. OK, so we have all these different things. Scalars, vectors, bivectors, trivectors. Um, we give these grades. So the, the bi meaning two and the tri meaning three, just grade two and grade th three elements in our mathematical system. And vectors have grade one, scalars have grade zero. And it really represents the number of vectors that have been wedged together to get that entity. So, um, and all of these together form what's called the 3D multi-vector algebra, where we have one scalar element, uh, three ve vector basis elements, the E1, E2, E3. And then we have three bivector elements and just the one trivector element, E1, 2, 3. Um, we can't have any higher grade elements than this because we would have to be able to wedge another basis vector in. And with the trivectors, we've already used all three of them. So if we try to add another one in there, we end up with a repeated subscript. And, in, and any vector wedged with itself is 0. So there can't be anything bigger than that. So this gives us a total of eight different basis elements in our three-dimensional system. In general, if we were to go to any number of dimensions n, then the number of k vector elements is n choose k, uh, because you're choosing k uh, different basis vectors out of a total of n. And this produces the nice symmetry, like what we saw here, the 1, 3, 3, 1. Um, and they always add up to 2 to the n power. And here's the symmetry again. So in three dimensions, we have our scalar, vector, three vectors, three bivectors, one trivector. In four dimensions, which is what I'm going to talk about mostly in the second half of this talk, uh, we have the scalars again, four uh, basis vectors. There's going to be six basis bivectors, because that's the, the value of 4 choose 2. And then four uh, trivectors, and then one pseudo scalar. There's also a five-dimensional conformal model that you might see in the literature. I'm not going to talk about that. But in that case, there would be 10 bivectors and 10 trivectors and five quad vectors. OK, so in four dimensions, uh, this is where all the important stuff happens. Uh, of course, we have four basis vectors. Uh, the number of bivectors is six, as I explained. Uh, and there are four trivectors, uh, because there are four ways to leave one vector out. Uh, of the entire basis. <clears throat> OK, so before I get more into four dimensions, uh, I wanted to talk about the confusion between vectors and bivectors. Since they both have three components in three dimensions, a lot of people don't realize that there's any difference. They look like the same thing. It is a three-component vector, three-component bivector. Um, and th this is a big reason for why the difference between the two isn't really well understood or, or is not widespread. But physicists noticed that there was something strange going on a long time ago. And they came up with different names for the vectors that behave differently. They call them, there's a bunch of different names, so like axial vector, pseudo vector, covector, covariant vector. And uh, they noticed that they transformed a little differently. Some examples of an axial vector would be uh, like torque or angular velocity. Uh, moment vectors. Uh, they noticed that they transform differently than ordinary polar vectors or contravariant vectors, which would represent a position in space or a tangent direction or a velocity, a linear velocity. Um, so they knew something was going on. And the simplest way to, to show what's happening here is to look at the cross product and what happens to it when you s make a simple reflection. Like, suppose. Uh, the matrix M here simply reverses the x direction and leaves everything else alone. Then if we were to just take the cross product between the x-axis and the y-axis, normally we would get the z-axis as the result. But if we transform both of these with that matrix that flips the x direction, then we're, we end up with uh, the negative x direction cross the y direction. And that would give us the negative z direction. But if we apply the, the same matrix to the answer that we got up here directly to 0, 0, 1, it doesn't do anything to it. It flips the x direction, but that's 0. So we get the wrong answer. Uh, transforming the result of a cross product is not the correct way to transform 
it doesn't give us the right answer that if we were to transform the inputs first. So something weird's going on here. And here's just an illustration of it. If, if we take the uh, this cross product A times B, it points up out of the plane here. But if we suppose this is a mirror here, so uh, A would point, would flip directions and B still goes this way. And then if we were to take that cross product, it uh, points in the opposite direction. It, it negates. So in general, if we were to expand uh, this vector A on the basis E1, E2, E3, and multiply everything out, uh, and then do it again for the vector B down here, take the cross product, and then we're going to multiply it out. And we end up with the coefficients of the cross product again. But they're multiplied by cross products of the columns of the matrix M. So I'm using this notation M with a subscript to mean the ith column of M. And these are actually these look just like the e, E2 cross E3, or E2 wedge E3, E3 wedge E1, et cetera. So if we were to take those three uh, basis elements from here and dot those with the one that's missing, so E2, or M2 cross M3 and dot it with M1, and then do the same thing for the other two, we always end up with the same determinant of M. We're just, this is a scalar triple product. Uh, so what does this mean? If we write this in matrix form, uh, where these cross products of the columns of M are the rows of a matrix, and then we multiply by the, the original matrix M itself, we get that produces the same result, end up with this diagonal matrix where the determinant of M is along the diagonal, which means that this matrix must be the inverse of M times the determinant of M. Just like this. And since we know that this matrix correctly transforms the, the result of a cross product, that means that a cross product is correctly transformed by the inverse transpose of M times determinant of M. Or if you want to write this as a row matrix and put it on the left, then you don't have to take the transpose. So here's the correct formula for, for transforming a cross product. Uh, if M transforms vectors from one coordinate system to another, then determinant M times M inverse transpose correctly transforms the cross product of two vectors from one coordinate system to another. So why is this the case? <clears throat> I'll get back to that in just a second. Uh, so if M is orthogonal, then the inverse transpose is the same as M. So And the determinant of M is 1. So we wouldn't have to go through all of this to transform a cross product properly. But if we have uh, something like a shear or a non-uniform scale, then we have to worry about this kind of thing. Um, if we were to leave the determinant off of here, then or actually, if, when we multiply the determinant by M inverse transpose here, uh, it's actually called the adjugate transpose in that case. So it's, it's the same as the inverse, but without dividing by the determinant. OK, so why does this work this way? Because when we take a cross product, we're not actually creating a vector, like all the textbooks say. We're creating a bivector. It's something that's different from a vector. It's expressed on a different basis than a vector. It's not, it's not really the E1, E2, E3 basis that a vector uses. Um, and because it's not a vector, it doesn't behave like a vector. And where this comes up in computer graphics is with normal directions, our normal vectors. Uh, we always compute a normal vector by taking the cross product between two tangent vectors. And we produce a bivector, and it doesn't transform the same way. If we were to use a matrix to transform a normal vector, here's an example of where it breaks down pretty badly. Suppose there is a transformation that uh, scaled only along the horizontal axis here, and it squishes this triangle down to this. If you were to use the same transform on this normal vector, which started out perpendicular to the surface, then it would sort of squish it along this. The, the side of the triangle there, and it wouldn't be perpendicular to the surface anymore. So w we can't do that. Now, you, you've, you're probably familiar with the fact that you're supposed to use the inverse transpose. And there's, there's a, a fairly simple proof as to why the inverse transpose is the right uh, matrix to use. Um, but it, it misses this extra factor of determinant M. 
So it doesn't work if there's any kind of reflection or scaling going on. Uh, we normally don't care about scaling for normal vectors because we're going to renormalize them anyway. Uh, but uh, just going through this really quickly, the, all this does is preserve the zero dot product between a normal and a tangent. So suppose there's some unknown matrix U that uh, we're looking for as the, the proper matrix for transforming normals. We just want to make sure that uh, U time, UN dot MT is still zero after we've tr made our transformation. And we re rewrite this dot product in, in terms of matrix products by transposing the, the term on the left. And then since we have this U transpose times M in the middle, we just come to the conclusion that, hey, if, if U transpose was equal to M inverse, then that would just cancel out. And we would end up with N dot T again, which is zero, which we know is zero. So, okay, we just conclude that U must be M inverse transpose. But all this does is prove that it works when you're trying to preserve a zero dot product. It, it doesn't include the extra determinant M that, that works in general. Okay, so getting on to higher dimensions. So as we've seen, uh, and this is the reason for the confusion between vectors and bivectors in three dimensions, is that uh, the N minus one vectors, so in three dimensions that would be your two vectors or your bivectors, in four dimensions that would be your three vectors or tri-vectors, um, they have the same number of components as the one vectors do. Because one vectors, uh, each basis element uses one of the, the E's, the E1, E2, or E3, et cetera. And the N minus one vectors leave one of those basis vectors out. So there, there's N ways to leave one of those out, just like there's N ways to choose one of those. Um, OK, and they're complementary to each other. So Obviously, we can choose E1, or we can choose everything except E1. We can choose E2, or everything except E2. And in four dimensions, we can do the same thing. We leave E1 out of this one and wedge everything else together. Leave E2 out of this and wedge everything else together. Now, why did I choose this ordering for these? Because we want, oh, when we multiply them together, we want the numbers to appear in, in the right order here without having to do any negations. And we use this special notation. Uh, a bar over E1 means wedge together everything except E1. A bar over E2 is everything except E2. And in the order that uh, this product gives us the E1234 in the right order. OK, now s instead of saying n minus 1 vector all the time, I'm going to use the term anti-vector. Uh, because it's, it conveys the meaning that it's everything that a vector is not. A vector is one-dimensional. An anti-vector is everything else, all your other dimensions. And it has the grade n minus 1, where n is the number of dimensions you're, you're working in. All right, so what happens when we multiply vectors and anti-vectors together? So in three dimensions, that would be a vector times uh, a bivector. So each of these E's with a line over it means everything except the subscript. So this is E2 wedge E3. This is E3 wedge E1. This is E1 wedge E2. OK, so we take a vector, wedge it together with a bivector. We get this after we've collected terms and uh, come up with our single basis trivector there. Uh, pretty obviously, this is just the dot product. So again, we started with just the fact that V wedge V had to be 0. And we're able to go through a bunch of multiplications and end up with the formula for the dot product. So when you learn cross product and dot product in school, they just give you the formula and say, OK, here's what it does. Here's, here's how you calculate these. Here's what it does related to cosine and sine. Go use it. Um, there, there's actually a way to derive these to come up with these from a very simple rule. I think that's very interesting. <clears throat> So vectors and anti-vectors, because we get this, this one scalar quantity out of it, actually the pseudo-scalar quantity out of it, uh, they, they sort of complement each other and they, they fill in the gaps. So one has all the vectors, one has all these things that represent everything except each of the vectors. OK. And in computer graphics, a lot of the dot products that we take are actually 
these wedge products between vectors and anti-vectors. And the, the most common example is n dot l in diffuse lighting. Uh, like I was talking about earlier, the, your normal vectors are really bivectors. Or in three dimensions, that's an n minus 1 vector, so I just call it an anti-vector. And when you're taking uh, the product n dot l, you're calculating the volume of an extruded bivector along the direction of l. Uh, like in this picture. So if there, if L is perpendicular to the surface, then you get your, your full volume, and that's where you have the brightest lighting. And then as L becomes more oblique, then this volume that we would compute with the N wedge L becomes smaller and smaller, and that, that pseudo-scalar value that you get out of it multiplies into your lighting equation and makes the surface darker. <coughs> Okay, so since we're taking a bivector times a vector, we end up with an antiscalar, n wedge L, um, which is different from a scalar. Like I mentioned a while ago, uh, antiscalars flip sign under a reflection. So uh, technically, we should be transforming, if, if we care, this usually doesn't happen. Uh, is, this is just a, a neat property, I think. Uh, if we were to ever need to transform the result of our n dot l scalar values, then the proper way to do it would be to transform n with the determinant m times m inverse transpose, and l being just a direction vector transforms with m. And if we multiply all that out, then the correct transformation formula for n dot l is to multiply by the determinant of m. So in the case of some orthogonal transform, that doesn't do anything. But if you have a mere reflection in there, that means that n dot l gets negated. And here's just a quick illustration. Suppose again that the orange line in the middle here is a mirror. And we've got a triangle with vertices P0, P1, P2. Uh, the typical way to calculate the normal vector would take P1 minus P0 and cross that with P2 minus P0. In that case, we get a vector pointing upwards out of the triangle here. And it, we have uh, an implicit winding counterclockwise. Suppose the direction to light pointed this way. Then in the mirror, it points that way. And in the mirror, our vertices have changed their winding direction. So the cross product that produces the normal, or the wedge product, if you want to think about it that way, uh, it changes sign. So under a, a reflection, your, our n dot l here, it was positive here. It's negative over here. So of course, if you were ever to reflect a mesh in a mirror, though, you would want to change the order of the vertices to, to fix all of this. OK. So I've been talking about what Grassman called the progressive product, the wedge product, for a while. There's uh, another product that Grassman uh, realized existed that is complementary to the wedge product. It goes backwards. Um, and it's not very well known at all. In fact, most geometric algebra books that I've seen ignore it completely in favor of some other products that I don't think are as fundamental. Um, this is actually very important, and it's, it, it produces a nice symmetry in the mathematical system that will become really useful a little bit later. OK, so just like the progressive wedge product operates on vectors uh, to produce bigger things, the regressive product operates on anti-vectors to produce smaller things. And we'll just use uh, an upside-down wedge to represent the regressive product. And it operates on anti-vectors the same way that the wedge product operates on vectors. So we're just doing things in reverse. And we'll call it the anti-wedge product. We'll just use anti for everything. has the same pro properties as the wedge product, um, but it works for anti-vectors instead of vectors. And it operates on the anti-basis, the dual basis. Uh, so the, the E bars instead of the E's. Okay, and like I mentioned, uh, the wedge product increases the grade. So if, if some entity A has grade R and another entity B has grade S, so maybe a vector with grade 1 and a bivector with grade 2, you multiply them together and you get something that has whose grade is the sum of the input grades. So a vector and a bivector multiply together to form a trivector with grade 3. Uh, the anti-wedge product sort of goes in the reverse direction. Um, but you have to look at grades relative to the dimension of the space. 
Um, I, I kind of like to think of anti-vectors as having grade negative 1, even though it's the same as n minus 1. And that when you multiply with the anti-wedge product, your, the grade that it produces uh, is sort of modular. So you can just add up the grades and then subtract n to, uh, to get the result. So in three dimensions, when you take the anti-wedge product between two anti-vectors, they both have grade 2, and they produce something that has grade 1. So 2 being 1 away from the total dimension 3, uh, you multiply them together and you end up 2 away from the total dimension 3. <clears throat> OK, in, in three dimensions, uh, the, the exact symmetric thing to uh, vector wedge products happens with the anti-wedge product. If we take E1 bar, anti-wedge E2 bar, then we just get E3, uh, which is symmetric to how if we wedge together E1 and E2, we would get uh, not E3 or E3 bar. And we use the same shorthand notation. Uh, we put extra subscripts here. It just means that we're taking, uh, for an E bar, that means that we're just taking an uh, anti-wedge product between multiple E's. OK, and these two products, the wedge and anti-wedge product, are actually very useful for doing things like unions and intersections. There, there's a, a very deep geometrical meaning behind all of this. Uh, I know I've, I've been very mathematical so far, and uh, this is where the applications start. This is where it starts to get very interesting. Um, the wedge product works kind of like a union, because you're, you're building up bigger things from smaller things. You're, so uh, the things that you get out of a wedge product span more dimensions. The anti-wedge product uh, works like an intersection. You take big things like planes or volumes, you multiply them together, and you get smaller things where those intersect. That's usually, that's sometimes called a meet operation, and the uh, unions are sometimes called a join operation. And the most useful uh, stuff happens in homogeneous coordinates in four dimensions. Uh, being graphics programmers, uh, most of us are familiar with working with points in homogeneous coordinates, where we append a w coordinate to our x, y, z coordinates. And uh, this allows us to transform things using a single 4 by 4 matrix to perform rotations and translations at the same time. And of course, uh, projection matrices use this very heavily uh, to perform projective transformations into screen space. Now, the three-dimensional representation of a homogeneous point is obtained simply by dividing through by the W coordinate. We want W to be 1. So we just divide through by the W coordinate. And that transforms some general homogeneous point P into the 3D, uh, the, the 3D point that it corresponds to. And that's the same as taking the intersection of the direction given by p in four dimensions with the, the plane or the subspace in four dimensions where w equals 1. And here's an illustration of that. So p is a vector in four dimensions. If we look where uh, the w equals 1 subspace slices through that ray, then we get our 3D point. Now, this can be extended to include lines and planes. And this has actually been done. Uh, in the past, but uh, they never had the full picture here of what's going on. I'll, I'll get back into that in a second. So in Grassmann algebra in four dimensions, we can apply the homogeneous model to points, lines, and planes, and use the wedge and anti-wedge products to do geometric computations. All right, so just a quick review of four-dimensional Grassmann algebra. We have our, our scalars. We have our four basis vectors, of course. We have our six bivectors. If you choose two numbers out of the four basis vectors, you can produce six different bivectors. And we have four anti-vectors, because there's four ways to leave one vector out. So this is really E234, E143, et cetera. And then we have our one anti-scalar unit quad vector. Um, and these add up to. 16 different basis vectors. We'll never use all of them at once, though. 
All right, so suppose that we have two points expressed in homogeneous coordinates with the W coordinate set to 1. I'm, I'm just setting that to 1 to simplify the calculations here. All this stuff still works if those aren't 1, um, but you have to consider, you have to add a PW and a QW over here. Okay, if we multiply these two points together, P wedge Q, where P and Q are four-dimensional with their W coordinates set to 1, then this is what we get after we simplify a little bit. Uh, we have our six bivector basis vectors here, and we have our six coefficients here. And now we have a bivector in four dimensions that spans a two-dimensional oriented subspace. Now, if we look at that, where it slices the subspace where W equals 1, then what we really have is a line in three-dimensional space. So this, this green parallelogram here represents the wedge product between P and Q. And if we look at where W equals 1 slices through that, we have a line that passes through the points P and Q. So all we did was multiply two points together, and now we have something that represents a line. And this line can be decomposed into two three-dimensional components. Um, so we have Qx minus Px, Qi minus Py, Qz minus Pz. That's just the difference between the 3D points Q and P. And then down here, you may recognize these three coefficients as the cross product between P and Q. So, but I'll, I'll call that the wedge product, actually, because we, we have a tangent vector here, and we have a what's called a moment bivector here. Six components decomposed into three different, or two different three-dimensional vectors. But uh, notice that after those calculations are done, after you take Q minus P and P cross Q, P wedge Q, uh, there's no longer any information about the points that were used to create the line. So you have this, this representation of a line, but the, the points that you actually use to make it are no longer there. You can't recover those points uh, once you've thrown them away. Uh, and this is different from the, the typical parametric formulation for a line, where you have P plus VT, uh, where you're, you're carrying around a point on the line with you all the time. Okay, so I've already mentioned this, that there's a tangent vector and a moment by vector that we'll call M. Now, the moment is perpendicular to the tangent all the time for a line, and it represents sort of the winding of the tangent around the origin. So suppose this is the origin in the middle. If our line sort of winds around the origin this way, then our moment's going to point up, just like you would expect uh, for like angular velocity. If you had something spinning counterclockwise, the moment vector points upwards. And if it spins the other way, the moment points downwards. The same thing is happening here. Now, these two vectors, tangents and moments, were actually uh, sort of independently discovered by Plücker, who uh, formulated a six-dimensional representation of lines based on the difference between the two points and the cross product between the two points. And he came up with a bunch of formulas uh, in homogeneous coordinates for combining this with homogeneous points and four-dimensional plane vectors to come up with unions and intersections of different uh, geometric objects. Um, if you look up Plücker coordinates, though, uh, in books or on Wikipedia or something, you'll, you'll find a bunch of different formulas, but really no explanation for what they came from. Uh, sure, you can prove that the formulas do give you what they say they give you, but uh, I think most of them were just found by trial and error uh, without knowing where they came from in here. It turns out that they're, they're all just wedge products and anti-wedge products, and I'll get back into the specifics of that in a minute. So we can keep going. Uh, we talked about homogeneous points and homogeneous lines now. Uh, if we throw another point in there and multiply it together with the first two points, then we end up with a representation of a plane. Um, and we have four components. Uh, so P wedge Q wedge R, we multiply that out and collect our terms then we get uh, four components expressed on the anti-basis vectors. Uh, so these include three of the basis vectors each. So this is an anti-vector in four dimensions. 
Uh, the first three components, you're probably very used to this already, is uh, the normal to the plane. And then there's a fourth component that represents the offset from the origin in units of the normal, in case the normal is not unit length. Um, if we were to assume, well, if, if we divide through by the W components of these three points, uh, there's actually a very elegant formula for computing the normal and the, the D value uh, that it doesn't give any preference to any one of the input points. So we got P wedge Q, Q wedge R, R wedge P. So that's every pair that you can choose out of the, the inputs. And then all three of them wedged together here and negated to get the D value. Um, this isn't really an efficient way to calculate this. It's still better to, to choose one of the input points and subtract it from the other two, take the, the by vector or the wedge product between those, and then take a dot product to uh, get your D value. But uh, I, I think it's pretty, pretty elegant how uh, there are formulas for these that uh, don't give preference to any single point. All right, now since planes are anti-vectors, they also don't transform the same way as points do. They, they transform like normals do in 3D, because those are normals are 3D anti-vectors. Planes are 4D anti-vectors. Uh, and they transform by the, the inverse of a 4 by 4 matrix in the same manner. Now, in three dimensions, a lot of times, most of the times, our transformation matrices are orthogonal. So we don't really have to worry about this. But in four dimensions, since we have that fourth column with our translation in it, our matrices aren't normally uh, orthogonal anymore. So we do have to worry about uh, taking the, uh, the inverse into account when we're transforming planes from one coordinate system into another. And this is something I use all the time in uh, game engines. OK, so, so now we've seen in 4D vectors, bivectors, and trivectors. And they can be used to represent something with one less dimension in 3D. So a one-dimensional vector is just a, a direction in 4D. And it becomes a point, a zero space in 3D. A, a two space, a bivector in 4D, represents a one-dimensional space, a line in 3D. And then, of course, a tri-vector is a three space in 4D. But when we look at its intersection with the W equals 1 subspace, that becomes a plane, a two-dimensional object in 3D. All right, so what can we do with all this? Uh, this is the good stuff. Uh, the wedge product lets us multiply two points together to get the line containing both those points. A, a bivector. If we multiply three points together, we get the plane containing all three points. If we multiply a line by vector and a point vector together, then we get the plane containing both the line and the point. And of course, this is assuming that the, the, the other point's not on the line and that these three points are not all collinear. Uh, if you do that, then you just get zero. All right, so th this is the wedge product builds things up. Points turn into lines or planes. A line and a point turns into something bigger, a plane. The anti-wedge product goes the other direction. We can multiply two planes together with the anti-wedge product to get the line where they intersect. We can multiply three planes together to get the point common to all three planes. Uh, again, assuming there's not a linear dependence there. We can multiply a line and a plane together, and we get the point where the line intersects the plane. So we, we've got these these three kinds of entities in homogeneous coordinates. And we've got these two products. And we can very easily do intersections and unions among all of those. Now, there are a couple more products that we, that we can take. Uh, what happens if we multiply a point and a plane together uh, with either the wedge or anti-wedge product? We get the, uh, the signed distance between the point and the plane in terms of the normal magnitude. Um, and it doesn't matter if you take the wedge or anti-wedge product, you'll get the same number out of it, uh, same magnitude, the same sign. And we can also multiply two lines together. And that gives us a special signed crossing value. So lines are bivectors. If we multiply them together with the wedge product, then we end up with the anti-scalar. If we multiply them together with the anti-wedge product, then we get the scalar on the other side. Uh, they both have the same sign and magnitude. And uh, Grassman actually treated these as the same. He said, they're just numbers. Um, it's not clear to me whether he understood that anti-scalar's flip sign 
under a reflection. And that may have stopped him from going a little further with this, because in Clifford algebras, um, you do have to make a distinction between antiscalars and scalars. OK, so, so looking at the line-line product a little more deeply, uh, so I said before that lines can be decomposed into a three-dimensional tangent and moment vector, or a tangent vector and a moment bivector, uh, both of which have three components in three dimensions. We take the wedge product between uh, two lines, two four-dimensional bivectors. Then we can express that in terms of the three-dimensional tangents and normals like this. Um, so the tangent is a vector. The moment is an anti-vector. So in three dimensions, this wedge product is really just a dot, what we're used to calling the dot product. So this is just a dot product plus a dot product, and then negate the whole thing. And th this is what Pluker called the permuted inner product. Um, don't know where that name came from, really. Uh, but it, it turns out it's, it's really just all it is is the product between two bivectors in four dimensions. And uh, we can use either the wedge product or anti-wedge product, and we'll get the same number out of these both ways. OK, but what does that number mean? Uh, it actually tells us how the lines cross in space, where a positive value means the lines are crossing in a clockwise orientation, and the negative value means they're crossing in a counterclockwise orientation. And the number of zero is zero if they happen to intersect. And here's an illustration of that. So uh, the product between the line will be positive if one is sort of winding clockwise around the other. It will be negative if one line is winding counterclockwise around the other. And uh, bivector multiplication is actually commutative. So it doesn't matter which way we multiply these together, we're going to get the same answer. Uh, in case you're curious, in general, if the product between the grades is even, then the wedge product is commutative between those two things. And if it's odd, then the wedge product is anti-commutative. Since the vectors uh, 1 times 1, if you were to take the, the grade of a vector times the grade of another vector, uh, that's odd. That's why vectors anti-commute. OK, so if we add one more thing. Uh, to the product between two lines, we simply divide by the wedge, the magnitude of the wedge product of the tangent directions, then that actually gives us the, the distance between the two lines, a sine distance, assuming the lines aren't parallel. OK, so an application where this comes in handy is ray tracing with triangles. Um, a typical implementation of an of a intersection between a ray and a triangle will use uh, very centric coordinates. So you, you calculate the position of the, the ray's intersection in the triangle's plane inside the triangle and see if it's inside the three edges. Uh, this leads to a lot of problems along the edges where you can either intersect both triangles. So if you have two triangles next to each other you, and you're pointing a ray straight at the edge, you might intersect both triangles sometimes, or you might miss both triangles sometimes if you don't use an epsilon to sort of expand the triangles along that edge. Um, and it's kind of inelegant to do it that way. Using Now, suppose that we had bivectors already calculated for all the edges of our triangles. And then for a ray, we cal calculate a bivector for that. And then we take the, the bivector, bivector product um, between the ray and all three edges of the triangle, then it's impossible for that ray to hit both triangles, except in the case that it's exactly 0. And uh, that, that can be handled in a consistent way using some tricks with uh, just saying, if, if the product is 0, then perhaps it'll belong to this triangle if the index of the first uh, vertex on that edge is less than the index of the second vertex. So you just choose some rule for determining which triangle that belongs to. It's not going to come up very often anyway because of floating point roundoff error. So anyway, th this, this sort of makes the uh, ray tracing triangles a bit more elegant and gets rid of the, the need for epsilons. Because if, if a ray hits the triangle, then you're going to get the same sign when you take the product of all three of the edges. OK, so we, we've got these three types of objects in four dimensions. Uh, they all have 
weights. We, we can define weights for all of these. Uh, for a point, it's just the W coordinate. And we want our weights to be 1. Uh, for a line, it's the magnitude of the tangent component, t. So if we were to normalize the tangent component and then divide the moment by vector by the same quantity that we used to normalize the tangent, then we, we come up with a normalized line. And for planes, we want to normalize the x, y, and z components because that represents the normal direction to the plane. And mathematically speaking, we can determine which components, uh, if you don't remember, <laughs> these, and you can determine which components uh, need to be normalized, which represent the weight by taking the anti-wedge product with the anti-vector 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, but we would never actually do this because all it does is sort of pick off certain components of the entity that we're working with. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, a, a line is normalized when its tangent component has unit length. Um, and when that is the case, the moment by vector component represents the perpendicular distance to the origin. So you, you get some information out of it that way. Now normalized planes, uh, as long as the x, y, z components are unit length, then uh, as you're used to, you'll be able to take the, the wedge product between a, a point with w coordinate 1 and a plane to get the sine distance to the plane where that's just what we're normally thinking of as using the dot product. Okay, so when we're programming with all of this stuff, uh, it's very convenient. I, I'm sure everyone in here has used a, a vector class, probably have a class for representing four-dimensional vectors. So we add to that two more classes for a four-dimensional bivector, which is really just going to be six floating point numbers, and then a four-dimensional anti-vector, which is going to be four floating point numbers. And then we can define products between all of those. Uh, and it's fortunate that C++ actually has something that looks like the, the wedge product here. Uh, and it's not being used for, for floating point. So we could define that between our vectors, bivectors, and anti-vectors in 4D and just have those calculate the product. So if we wanted to take intersections and unions among all those things, all we got to do is multiply them together. Uh, but there's one thing we need to be careful of, and that's the fact that the, the bitwise operators have the lowest precedence of all operators, even lower than the, the relational operators. So if you were to write something like this and say, oh, I want to take the wedge product between x and y and see if it's greater than 0, the compiler will actually interpret it like this. It'll do the, the greater than operation first. So you're going to have to get used to putting parentheses around all of your, your wedge products if you decide to implement this. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, there's not a symbol that we can use for the anti-wedge product. Um, but it's not really going to be necessary. Because for most things, uh, in fact, for everything, when you take a wedge product or an anti-wedge product, uh, one of those is almost always going to be 0. Like, suppose you had two planes. Those are three vectors. Those are, those are tri-vectors in four dimensions. If you were to take the wedge product between those, they would have grade 6, which is bigger than the dimension of the space, so it's automatically 0. And if you were to take the anti-wedge product between two points, um, those have grade negative 3, um, or grade 1, same, same thing. If you were to multiply those together with the anti-wedge product, then you have something with grade uh, negative 6, which is too small. Uh, so it's automatically zero. So you could just use the uh, the upward pointing wedge for all your products and just say that okay, you take either the wedge product or the anti wedge product, whichever one gives you useful information, because the other one's just going to give you zero. Um, th the only exception is the the case when you're multiplying two lines together, or or two things together that whose grade adds up to the dimension of the space. So either a point times a plane or a line times a line, you always get something that has grade 4. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether you take the wedge product or anti-wedge product. You're going to end up with the same number. So uh, there, there's no need to implement two different products there. OK, and once you have that kind of stuff available to you in code, uh, it, it can simplify a lot of the expressions that you have in other places in a game engine. 
And here's an example. Uh, in game engines, a lot of times there are reasons to use regions of space that are bound by a set of planes. So in this case, we have our view frustum here, which is bound by six planes. And if we're rendering uh, from a light source and we want to know what region of space, this is just an example, what, what region of space uh, objects have to be in in order to cast shadows into the, the region of space that we can see, then we have to form this big volume that encloses the view frustum and the position of the light. And the way that's done is to look for all the, for each of the planes in the view frustum, classify those as either facing the light source or facing away from the light source, and then identify the edges between ones that, that do face and ones that don't face. Now, we can calculate ahead of time uh, the bivectors that represent the lines between each of these two planes. And all that takes is a, a single wedge product, um, if we, or anti-wedge product. If we take the, the anti-wedge product between two adjacent planes, we instantly have the line that uh, represent, that contains the edge between those two planes. And if we were to multiply that by the light position here, so we have the line by vector and the light positions vector, then that instantly gives us the plane containing uh, the edge and the light position. So uh, what would take a lot of different vector operations uh, without this stuff just turns into a, a, a couple of products in this case. So it, it's, it's possible to simplify code and come up with more elegant implementations of a lot of different things. This is just one example of many. I actually use this kind of stuff all over my code. All right, so summarizing, what have we learned today? So what we used to call, or the cross product, produce things that physicists call axial vectors, we can now think of as a wedge product producing a bivector. So no, no longer are we thinking of taking the cross product between two tangents to obtain a normal vector. We're, we're now taking the wedge product between two tangents to produce the normal bivector. And it, it's good to think of normals in terms of the tangent plane now, because really the, how a normal direction pointing out of a surface only makes sense in three dimensions. It's just because that, that's the complement to the plane, and it only works in three dimensions. In four dimensions, you can't do that. There's an entire two space that's perpendicular to your surface. Um, same goes for uh, thinking about rotations about an axis. Uh, in three dimensions, we can say that we're rotating around this direction, but in other dimensions, that doesn't make any sense. But in every dimension, it's okay to think about rotating in a plane, and that's what a bivector represents. So an axis of rotation is really a bivector. So things oriented to that bivector rotate, and things perpendicular to that bivector do not. All right, so the dot product um, we saw was really just the product between an anti-vector and a vector. The scalar triple product is really just the wedge product between three different vectors. Fluker coordinates are really one little piece of a bigger system. We saw that that's really just uh, a bunch of operations on four-dimensional bivectors. Uh, <clears throat> And transforming normals with the inverse transpose arises because normals aren't really vectors. They are bivectors expressed on a different uh, basis. So we, they have different transformation laws. And I went through all of that for you. So uh, I, I hope that uh, I've inspired you to, to think about this a lot and uh, maybe even implement some of this in your code. And uh, I'll open it up to questions.